Here's the church. Here's the steeple. Now open the doors and see all the people. <laughs> so dumb. <laughs> yes, it is. Do you remember singing that, though, as a kid? I didn't sing it, but I remember saying it. Today on the podcast, we are talking about the church building, Constantine, and the movement from house churching to regular churching that we know today. Churching, huh? Yeah. You know, churching. All Doing right. church. It's in the dictionary. Churching. I think it's a verb. The okay. Act, the act of doing church. Okay. All right. Well, let's get started. I'll look it up later. <laughs> okay. Have you heard this saying before? If we could just get those young whippersnappers in the church. Yes, I've heard that too. <laughs> or how about like, you know, we've gone to church every Sunday for the past six months. I can use the vacation. Maybe not the last part of that sentence. But. No, I have definitely heard that I've been to church. I haven't missed a Sunday yet. Has somebody ever come up to the stage and isn't it just wonderful to be in the house of the Lord today? Oh yeah, usually that's the pastor. I hear that all, almost every week we hear something like that or... Yeah. Or I remember uh, growing up as a kid and you wear a hat in a church and the old ladies get mad at you because uh, you're supposed to be reverent in the house of the Lord. That's right. Take that hat off. Take that hat off. You're in God's Why house. But it seems like the American church has a huge love affair with the building. Definitely. It's all about the building. It's all about that building, about that building. I mean, we're, Andrew and I are part of a church plant that uh, five years ago we started in a house and then we moved to a school and one of the questions we were always getting was well when are you guys going to get you a building i wanted to smack people every time i heard that I was like why do we need a building where in this biblia do we need one yeah i mean don't you know you're in the bible belt dusty you're not a church unless you have a building i'm, I'm glad you're saying that we're in the bible belt because last podcast you were like we're not the bible belt we're north no, I did not. Sorry. Sorry. I don't want to bring up the past. I was going to say, I have the recording. I can show you that I was not the one saying that. Uh, I beg to differ. You said Iowa was the Bible Belt. I did not say that. I have the recording. I did not say that. I said... You said, I grew up in the Bible Belt in Iowa, which is not the Bible I'm Belt. I'm pretty sure I didn't... I, I don't know. <laughs> I would hate to say that I thought the Bible was in Iowa because I know that that's not true. Well, at least that's... maybe I know that now because you told me. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Even my wife was laughing at you when she heard the uh, <laughs> podcast. Okay. Oh, so okay. Well, I stand corrected. <laughs> but uh, you know, I just remember always being asked when we we're going to have a building, and, and, and it seemed like people's idea of your church actually being. Being um, a church <laughs> until it's really considered a church is when you have four walls that you meet in that's your own. Not even we can't even meet in a school with four walls. That's right. You know we had to have one that we personally had a mortgage for. And exactly. If you're not making payments on it, it's not yours. It is not a true house of the Lord. <laughs> that's the American way, right there, Dusty. And that, I mean that's really funny. I mean that's that's exactly kind of in. The book goes on talking about Constantine, and that's exactly what we were talking about in his time. You know, they were meeting in church in houses, and uh, they were actually expanding their living rooms in those houses to make room for. I mean, now nowadays probably fit like ten Americans in there. Because yeah, because you have to have your big lazy boy loungers. <laughs> yeah, and you no, have to make room for the air conditioner. But in those times, they were you know they weren't. They didn't have to have the air conditioning. They could sit on the floor. They could stand all day, you know, whatever it took to cram 70 people into a living room setting and uh, just, you know, do life together, fellowship and talk about the word of God. And uh, nowadays, you know, in, in Constantine's time, that really wasn't recognized religion. With right. all the pagan, pagan religions going on, you had to have that building. That brick right. and mortar. And so, I mean, Ju Judaism had their temples. Catholicism had their buildings. 
and uh, they didn't recognize Protestant the Protestant movement or the Christianity as a religion until uh, they got their buildings. Right. So Constantine set up a building, and he was what was it? Pagan priest was that his title? Something like something that. Something like that. He was like the priest of pagans. Or something like that. Basically, I what I said. <laughs> That's basically a, what I said, Andrew. You just reworded it. Okay, so he was, but and so he worshipped many other gods, not just um, the Christian religion. But he wanted, he was very passionate about getting the Christian religion established um, and recognized. And so that's where he started that process. That now today, even we, to be able to be recognized even by our fellow Christians as a church, we have to have the building. The building. Pontifex Maximus. Pagan priest. Chief of the pagan priests. Oh, that was his title? Yep. Ah. Pontifex Maximus. Chief of the pagan priests. So that's kind of what I said. Just not the word chief in it. So, Andrew, uh, do you think that most Christians equate the word church with the building? Or do you think that people think of church as the body of Christ? Definitely the building. I don't think not too many Christians have changed their mindset that the body of Christ is the believers. I believe they think it's a building. So, I mean, what what kind of problems does that bring about when we, we equate church with the building itself? You know, I guess there, I don't know too many problems it brings about. I mean, other than the fact that turn church on and off. Yeah. I mean, on Sundays when you go to church, there that's church. Not whereas every day, Monday through Sunday, you are the church. And so really it's just going to be their thinking, their thought process and how they act throughout the week and, and compared to when they get to church on Sunday, they hit that parking lot, that smile turns on. Right. It's a, I think you're on the right track there where it's, it's kind of, we were able to separate our lives from our church life in our real life. Yeah. We turn on that fake, you know, we say the right Christian words, we say the right Christian sayings, we do the right Christian things in that one hour a week. And that makes us a Christian and that makes us go into heaven. And that's not, true i mean the church is more than just a service right it's more than one hour a week it's a it's a lifetime it's a dedication it's a lifestyle a life change and that's what frustrates me even in my own life you know i i struggle with having a great prayer life outside of church you know i struggle with reading my bible or even reading this book outside of you know the right settings and that should you know, and I, I'm passing some blame, but I think some of that is just my mentality, you know, is I'm not used to putting church in my daily life. You know, I'm not used to putting worship as part of my daily living and, and experiencing God. And so I, you know, I don't put that work in. I'm just, I guess I've always grown up just expecting the preacher to tell me what to do and what the Bible says and then... You know, it's up to me to follow that <laughs> the rest of the week. I've taken away the responsibility that I have and that I should do as far as following Christ and reading his word for myself and allowing him to speak to me directly and not having to go through a priest or a pastor. Is there anything else that you think of that uh, having a building can kind of hinder your spiritual walk? Not really. Not off the top of my head. I could see some good that comes out of it. Well, what are some good things? I mean, it gives a place for the community to come to if they should need help. It gives a body of believers a place of of worship that are uh, like minded. It, it just gives a centralized location. I would, I would just add to that maybe a non Christian or non believer when they need help, they can see a building. On the side of the road. See, we we live in the Bible Belt, and about you can just drive down the road, and you'll see about four or five churches. It's pretty ridiculous, and um, but yeah, th- those those people will know. Hey, if I need help with this, you know, I can. If I need prayer, if I need some support, I can go to this church, and that's where I'm going to find help, which is good. I mean, in in that thought process of the church is there to help <laughs> that's great because yeah, that is why the church is there the negative side of that is sometimes as a christian we just expect people we wait for them to show up for help right instead of us going out 
And so instead of evangelizing, we are just inviting people to church, again, passing the buck off to the pastor for him to, it's his job to lead them in a salvation prayer by the end of the service. You have one hour to convert. With three songs, you know, you can't have church without music of some sort. Right. And hopefully passing around the tithe bucket doesn't turn them off. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You do that. Churches have done that at the end now. So they get saved first, and then you're like, okay, so before you leave, let's uh, don't be pressured to give if this is your first time. Now, second time, you better be I'm joking. feeling that pressure. I'm but, uh, yeah, you better be feeling that Holy Spirit. You you accepted Christ. He's in you. You got to do something. You got to get involved. You got to contribute. So as we continue to talk with Constantine, the church, I mean, overall, it's it's okay. You know, the, having a building isn't. Like the, oh my gosh, I can't believe that we are having a building is totally, that's not what the Bible says to do. The people in Acts met in the houses, you know, the the church building is effective. It is because people aren't just going to show up and knock on your door nowadays and say, hey, can't come to church. Right. The church building is there. People driving by who are feeling at that moment that they need God in their life. They're, they have a building to go to. I was taking me a little bubble bath last night. Oh, it wasn't bubbles in it, but maybe a rubber ducky or something. <laughs> but uh, I was thinking, I was I was watching some YouTube videos last night. YouTube videos are talking about pagan. I think it's a book called Pagan Christians or Christian Pagan or something like that. Um, along the same lines of this book, talking about the things that Christianity has brought that are based off of a pagan practice or something. And uh, you know, I, I think most Christians know by now that December is not when Jesus was born. You know, right. it's a pagan holiday that we have taken and put the Christian spin on it. And so, but these people were talking, you know, they were just kind of like, I didn't celebrate Christmas to yesterday because that's not when Jesus was born. And they get so hung up on that one point. And then I saw this commercial that popped up later and it was talking about how Jesus's real name was covered up. His name wasn't Jesus. It was Yahweh, you know, and it's just like, it doesn't matter. I mean, you know, Jesus isn't going to send us to hell because we spelled his name wrong. <laughs> you know, like, come on, like, really pick your battles. And we're celebrating. It doesn't really matter when we're celebrating. And, and yes, it's coming from a pagan practice or pagan party that we're taking the the act of christian and, and christmas on and we're taking the christmas tree and putting our spin on it you know but but still it like that's really we're still celebrating jesus definitely and so i see people that can pick up this book and that's the first thing they'll be like is man they had no buildings in acts you know they had no church buildings and the apostles and so that's the church building is you cannot experience worship. You cannot experience God in a church building. You know, I think that could be a natural reaction that people would take. I could see that, too. And sometimes I can have, you know, because I I struggle with how we do church. I mean, that's the whole point of me and you like looking for a book right. to, to read. And, and I think there's some unrest there. And rightly so. I think there's kind of a spiritual awakening or a spiritual movement that's getting ready to happen or is happening now that hasn't hit the Bible belt yet. But it's just about people wanting to, to be true to God and not into what all we've created, <laughs> you know. To be able to worship him. Well, and I think the Bible Belt is going to be one of the last places it hits because the Bible Belt, with all these churches, this these these are people's careers, right? And so got, they don't want it to change. Yeah, you got careers, you got you know just pastors who this is they like their, the control and the power, the control and the power, and even people too. We've been in churches where you know you have families that are heads of committees that can just control and and spin the church whatever way they want to, right? And uh, do with the church, whatever they want to do through it. And so, yeah, there's a lot of pride that could be, that stops us in the Bible belt. And, but I don't know, like, I think in Oklahoma, we're always slower anyways. Like everything is, gets slower here. So look at the way they do church in India or China or or any of those Asian countries. It's all in houses, mainly because it's illegal. (laughs) Yeah. Like they're kind of, forced to to meet in their house otherwise they might die but it is extremely (laughs) effective it is extremely effective and i also wonder with the fact that it's so dangerous does that make it more effective you know because it's real you know it's it's not like you say a prayer and then you continue to live your life the same in china you say a prayer and you drastically change your future (laughs) and Especially uh, if you did it in public. Especially if you did it in public. 
And yeah, so I, I, I America Church, uh, yeah, we're going to be slower. And in Oklahoma in general, I think we're going to be slower. Now, one of the interesting things, this book really goes in depth about uh, all the different practices and cultures, mainly this chapter. Uh, the church building is not just the building itself, but what goes on in the building and the design of the interior. But one of the things I found interesting was actually the Lord's Supper. If you look at the, the famous picture of the Lord's Supper, you know, it's a full out meal. Right. Since the fourth century Christians, it's been turned into just a swallow of wine and a piece grape, of bread. And grape juice and a cracker. Yeah, if you're Baptist, it's <laughs> grape juice. In those little tiny crackers. Yep. Yeah. The communion crackers. But yeah, I mean, that they were having a final meal together. And Jesus takes two aspects of the meal. And uh, that's all that we do. I mean, Baptists, we can't have anything without a full meal. But when we... We don't relate that to the Lord's Supper itself. We don't no. celebrate the Lord's Supper with the meal. Right. While we're eating and drinking, we don't just make a sermon out of the mashed potatoes and the <laughs> Pepsi. Yeah. I did do, I think it was like a Jewish, uh, we had a Messianic Jew one time come and do a Passover meal with us. And it was really cool. And it did take each each individual thing on the plate that you ate that time represented something in it was really cool. There was one, one thing that was like really – I just remember it was really bitter, and you tasted it, and you just like, oh, my gosh, it's so nasty. And that represented your sin. Go figure. Yeah, your sin is nasty. That's what I would have guessed, actually. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, it's not the blood of Christ. You know, it's not that thing. No, blood has a sweet taste to it. <laughs> How would you know? Well, what I thought was uh, I, I kind of like the temples, priest, and the sacrifices uh, oh, portion yeah. of the chapter. Um, it talked about when Jesus came, you know, that was the structure. There was a temple to meet at. There was a main priest that would preach the word or read the scrolls or whatever. And then there was the sacrifices that you had to do to, um, cause at the time we had, you had to sacrifice for your forgiveness. Right. Right. And so, um, Jesus, he came, he ended all three. He fulfilled them himself. You know, he is the temple when he died, the, Temple was destroyed. Yes, his body was the temple that was destroyed, but the Pharisees thought that he was going to destroy the actual temple. Right, right. He ripped the robe. Right, right. The robe was ripped away. Well, right from the bo- uh, top to the bottom. From the bottom. I think I the top to the bottom. Golly, I should re- see. I should read my Bible, Dad. Gummit. I'm pretty sure it was from the top to the bottom because anybody could have done it from the from bottom, bottom to the top. Right. But only God could do it from the top to the bottom because this thing was, was something like 60 feet high. Something like that. I should ask my son. He's six. He knows all these Bible stories yeah. by heart. Ancient Judaism was centered on three elements, the temple, the priesthood, and the sacrifice. When Jesus came, he ended all three, fulfilling them in himself. He is a temple who embodies a new and living house made of living stones without hands. He is the priest who has established a new priesthood. He is the perfect and finished sacrifice. Consequently, the temple, the professional priesthood, and the sacrifice of Judaism all passed away with the coming of Jesus Christ. Christ is the fulfillment and the reality of it all. Are you trying to audition for a book reading job through Audible? Through (laughs) Audible.com? Yes, sir. (laughs) That was a good job. But yes, that's the exact... Part I was talking about in the book here, just talking about how Jesus fulfilled all three, and yet slowly we brought them back into our into our culture. I did think it was was it Catholicism that that brought back all three. Like they had the incense burning sacrifices, yes. the priest and the temple. Like they all needed all three of those. And then our churches today, we've we've taken down the sacrifices and we've taken down the temple, so to speak, but we still have the clergy. Um, we haven't gotten rid of that. I wouldn't say we really took away the temple. I mean, we still have our buildings, yeah. Which is our form of a temple. The scheme of things, though, we we all say that we are the church. I mean, we believe that, that we are the church, not the building. Even though we live that the building is the church and, you know, we just go to it. But what I'm saying just in the deep, in the actual belief like we still need that clergy ahead of us, you know, and right. And 
how uh you know we got all the pulpits and the the seats and everything how the stage is all centered towards the one guy all right or how, the, how the pulpits lifted up yeah and everything so we can all see him you know and there's you know we yeah that's that's how you do it you know he's not going to like stand in the middle and and hope that people can hear him <laughs> and hope they know who's talking but at the same time like it's not necessarily supposed to be focused on just that, I guess. In a house church, where when we have a house church, I lead the lesson, but we're sitting around as equals, and uh, and all participating, all in participating. We're all answering, you know, our our thoughts of what what the Bible's talking about or what it's saying in this passage here. And so um, there is not like a headship, or I mean, sometimes they'll still look to me to go to the next question or whatever because. I've prepared, you know, and kind of read ahead of time, but, but it's just a different feel. It's it's not you're not trying to get everything off the stage, you know. You're looking for to each other for the answers and right because any any given moment somebody else is going to be asking a question or could be asking a question. And that's that's the goal. I mean, the goal at our house church is that we do ask more questions because really we don't even have like we when we talk about scripture we talk about the sword method. You know, and there's just four questions when we examine scripture that we talk about is, you know, what do we learn about God? What do we learn about man? What are some sins to avoid and some some uh, commands to follow? And in that, our discussion breaks out of different things that we find and questions that we have. And so I don't have a list of questions to lead them somewhere. We're we're going together trying to find. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we're not all going like the pigs that, you know, the. Right. Evil spirits go into. And hopefully, I just don't lead them off a cliff into the. <laughs> the <laughs> I hope that doesn't happen. But well, enjoy your fall if that does. You know, just enjoy it while it lasts. <laughs> Do some backflips. <laughs> act like a bird. Enjoy it. I'm a snake. I'm a snake. You seen that video? <laughs> no, I haven't. I'm a slitherly snake. To wrap up the the church building section, Dusty, I wanted to. Read a paragraph. It's on page twenty-seven. Another, another audible, right? Another <laughs> audible moment. <laughs> so it's, it says the church building was borrowed from the pagan culture. Dignified and sacramental r- ritual had entered the church services by way of the mysteries, and was justified like so many other things by reference to the Old Testament. To use the Old Testament as a justification for the church building is not only inaccurate, but it is self-defeating. I just like that. Yeah. So let's go on to page 24 and talk about the uh, major influences in worship. All right. So page 24, and hopefully you've been you got the book and you've been reading it yourself, so it'll be a little more uh, understanding of what's – as we move quickly through all these sections here. But page 24 talks about the major influences of worship and – and it was interesting that as the Christian movement started, uh, the everyday person, they showed up in their regular clothes. And then when Constantine comes in um, with the clergy establishment, it's back to the Sunday best. That's right. By the way, where did Sunday get its name, Dusty? Uh, wasn't it like a pagan god that they worship the sun? Yes. Because really the seventh day is a Saturday, right? Right. And um, It was actually Constantine. He um, worshipped the sun. That was his, the major god that he worshipped. And that was the major god of that time as well. I think uh, in um, the pagan culture, the what is it? Jews and Gentiles. So in the pagan culture or the Gentile culture, they worshipped on Sunday because that's the sun. Sunday is when they worshipped all the gods, and uh, and so that's where church also happened, not on the seventh day. On the first day, on Sunday. Right. On the pagan day. Just interesting. I mean, if we're going to take all these pagan rituals, we may as well do it on a pagan day. So we're not getting any credit in heaven right now for worshiping on Sunday. Nope. We all need to go Saturday. It's too late. I mean, we're not even saying his name right, so <laughs> good luck, guys. Good luck. I don't know. Jews, uh, they still... St. Peter's going to be up there going... I'm sorry, was Dusty spelled with an I or a Y? I guess I spelled it wrong, sorry. All right, let's <laughs> go to major influences, Dusty. 
Okay, so uh, one of the things that, that stuck out to me is just talked about how it went from you know the, everybody participating and being involved in the service to now the clergy guy being they're being the ones that are acting out the sacrifices and and participating in the spiritual acts of worship and like taken away from the participation of the people they're more just watching watching it happen. I just thought that was interesting because that's the one thing I get asked a lot uh, when I talk about house church and doing church in our house is stressful but rewarding. You know, like it's stressful because of, we live in a small house to begin with. It's as much as we love these people, we're not going to let them see our house dirty. So we have to keep it clean. And and some Wednesday when people are getting ready to come over, that's like the only day we clean our house. <laughs> I say that, but my wife cleans a lot. That's the only day I help clean the house. Okay, we'll put there. You go. Yeah, that's exactly that how it is. It's just stressful, you know. You have you're getting right after work. People are getting ready to come over, and so you're just you know trying to get you don't have that relaxation when you first come home through the door and get the veg. It's stressful on that end, but it's so rewarding. Just you know, I love everybody that's in my house church. I love just talking to them and 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 being a part of their lives. And we don't actually just meet on Wednesday. We do life outside you know we we hang out on friday nights we hang out on tuesday nights whatever is going on we're usually somebody in our groups participating in life with each other and so i think that's great i think it's a movie but one thing that was asked of me was okay that's good and all but you know what about those you know those are called to preach those are called to do whatever you know where are they going to be able to enact on their calling because one of the things i said is that I, I listen to Seth Godin. He's one of the marketing guys that I, I listen to a lot. And he was talking about how, like, with our school system, and, and even you can equate it to churches, but we have a lot of mediocre people that are teaching the Word of God. And that's that's fine. They're, they're, you know, we have a lot of the same sermons being preached every Sunday morning by people that don't have time to plan sun, full Sunday sermons all week long. And or they're a terrible deliverer at a Sunday sermon, you know, and it's not very effective. And so why wouldn't you be like like a, a church that's in our area is called Life Church, and they have a very gifted communicator, and he preaches a sermon, and he actually preaches it live, and they live feed it. The church, they have their own separate band and everything, and then the sermon comes on, and everybody's watching the video of him preaching. And people are like, I cannot believe that these do that. That's so weird. Da, da, da. But it's effective. Very You've got a very gifted communicator on stage, and you still got your pastor, campus pastors that are able to be what a pastor is, you know. All right, a counselor and a guy. Counselor and serving the people and helping people in need, like those kind of things, and, and even wrapping it up and helping people understand it afterwards. And so, I, just to me, like, like that kind of frustrates me as far as how many churches I've been into, and it's like. I cannot believe I'm sitting through another stupid sermon and and a guy that, you know, probably doesn't want to be up there to begin with because that's not where his true gift is or his true, you know, it's just to be able to do with his calling. He has to fulfill this act, you know, and so it's like being a youth pastor. You can't it's really hard to be a youth pastor if you don't play guitar and sing because people are usually trying to fill two positions with that one position, you know. Right. So the only guys that really get a good, good head start are those that can play guitar and sing, and that's not fair. Nobody complains about that. Life's not fair, does he? Life's not fair. The Bible's not fair. Salvation. It's not. Salvation is not fair. It's not because one man died for all of our sins. But, that's not fair. But my my so people ask me that like okay so where are people going to be able to use their gifts and and my thought is okay so the preachers they weren't preaching in the house churches they were preaching in the marketplaces. You know, they're preaching out in the streets to the people. So why do that? Why does it take away from their calling if they can't do it on that one Sunday morning? That's what I struggle with. Like, okay, there's gifted singers out there, and there's some non-gifted singers out there. They're all participating in worship. But if you're going to do a show kind of feel, you know, that reaches certain people, gets people in, where everything is excellent, there's people that miss out on singing along or leading people. Sorry little rabbit hole that I just got lost in. Go to the overheads. Oh, gosh. The overhead is like, Andrew's been like waiting to talk about overhead. It's always about the money with this guy. It is. It's all about the bench. Or in Desi's case, the Washingtons. The Washingtons. Sometimes I got a little Abraham Lincoln in there. All right, Dusty, do you remember this? Lordy! Lordy! <laughs> Lordy! 
<laughs> That's the only time we're going to play that on this podcast. <laughs> Andrew thought it would be really funny every time we said something controversial that he would play a warning, warning, warning clip. And I vetoed that. So I guess if you think that's really funny and we should do it, then hash- let us know. Hashtag Andrew's right. I don't know. Hashtag, is it? hashtag warning, warning, warning. Hashtag warning, warning, warning. Hashtag Andrew's right. He should say warning, 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 warning. That's a really long that's hashtag. Like, that would be like 140 character <laughs> hashtag. Can't say anything else with it besides that. So we got our warning out of the way. Let's go to the overhead. All right. So Andrew's very passionate about overhead. And so one thing that he's very passionate about is clergy salaries, I believe. Yes. And we're actually not going to go too far into that, Andrew. There's a whole section with clergy. You'll have a full podcast to just discuss that. So right now we're just going to talk about the other sides of the overhead. That is chapter eight. That's a long ways away. Oh, my goodness. But we're already in chapter two. Because so, all our pastor friends will stop listening at chapter 8. <laughs> this is true, because I'm going to so, make them all mad. So um, you're going to make them mad, and I'm going to have to kind of be like, smooth it over. I don't know. I haven't read it yet, so I don't really know what it says. But Answer this then, Dusty. Does okay. the fact that the church has spent an enormous amount of money and overhead on its building, uh, approximately $10 billion annually, does that concern you? I mean, that's something that's really frustrated me for... A while. I mean, I asked my pastor the other day. I was just, you know, I was struggling with just, just churches in general. You know, I've been a part. I've worked for a church. I've been in leadership in churches for a while, a few different ones. And, and like one thing I saw one time I got it. We bought drum, drum mics for our, you know, I played drums and I don't, I'm not even a drummer, but we didn't have a drummer. So I ended up back in the day when all the Christian, Church songs were all the same. We bought some drum mics, and it was just because we were under budget for our youth ministry, and it was getting to the end of the year, and we got to spend it. Otherwise, they won't. They will lower the budget next year. And it was just kind of like at the time, sweet free drum mics, you know. But now, I like think about it, I'm like, golly, look at all that waste, you know. And uh, I was just, I asked my pastor, you know, just because churches do that all the time. Like I just feel like there's a lot of, not even just overhead, just dumb things that we spend money on just because we can you know and then we still have have to have extra building funds here and there for whatever else we're doing you know special offerings for these things like wait a minute if we didn't buy all this crap we would not have to have special offerings you know (laughs) and um so i i just i mean the question i just struggle with is is god even honored by how we spend our tithe not as the person giving the tithe i mean that's a whole another thing i think that's in another chapter about tithing yes but is god you know when it comes to the tithe is god even honored by it because of how much is wasted how much is wasted and how much goes just to exist and especially in the bible belt when we have six to seven churches in a square mile not that's that's probably too low i should have you're, you're right. There's probably I mean, a dozen within a square mile. A dozen within a square mile. Okay, and so we have all these churches doing the same things, mediocre, and mediocre sound systems, all that stuff, and yet because we're spending all this money I, to do the same junk, and it's just like, is God even honored by that? Because what we – and I, I posed the question, what if like my house church, for instance, what if we – what if we gave a tithe to God, but we didn't give it to the church? And what if we just, you know, used that tithe and ran it like a church? Or I can even start a 501c3, whatever it takes to become officially a recognized nonprofit organization. Like the, um, who was that, Jimmy Kimmel? Was it, no, it was John Oliver, wasn't it? John he, Oliver, Yeah, yes. he, he recently kind of did that. I can't, it was super funny. But... What if and he just basically was showing how easy it was to, to start be a and create and how and he was going off the tangent of how how much waste is spent on this money that's giving to God of these televangelists mainly and how they're just blowing money buying you know charter planes and all this stuff and, and how it's just ripping people off is what his point was and he's like we're just gonna start our own you know thing but but my question was so what if we did that and so, so we meet at my house, so maybe we'll cover the cost of the meals, you know, because people, I mean, that raised our budget a month for food, about a couple hundred dollars to be able to feed everybody. 
Um, and we, we, I'm sure it raised everybody else's too, cause we re-rotate our meals. My question is, so what if we did that? Our house church, we also sponsor a compassion child. That's another thing that's out of our pocket, you know, above and beyond our tithes and offerings. So what if we were able to sponsor that compassion child, maybe even some more? Um, and then the money that we have left over, we can help, you know, help people in need in our house church. We can go out into the community, do different things. To me, like in, in a small, like younger group of people, and I say younger, I just turned 31, so I'm the grandpa of the group. I still, people tell me I'm young, but I really feel old, especially when I try to get up out of this chair. Would God be more honored by how that's spent going out towards the people being used effectively than to just exist? And, and the argument for the existing part is that people are coming and getting saved. You know, if, it, if it's working, does it matter how much we're wasting to make it work? You know, I don't know. To me, I, that's just a question I have and a question I struggle with. And I mean, I've always tithed for the longest time, but and I still do tithe now. But it's just, you know, I've heard some preachers say, well, you just got it. Your, your job is just to give to the church. The church is responsible. The pastors are responsible for how it's spent. And I think that's just a bunch of bull. Like that just gives no accountability to the pastors because they're accountable to God. I'm sorry, but you're also like if I see that you're spending it stupidly, I feel like that's, you know, my right to be like, no, <laughs> like I'm not going to just fund your stupidity, you know. Exactly. And so I've I've I struggle with that, with the waste. Sorry, I'm another another I'm monologue another by monologue. Dusty. Golly, Andrew never didn't interrupt me. So I just in the business world. Overhead kills. That's what kills most of uh, new businesses. You can attest to this, Dusty. I mean, you're you just hired two employees. Yeah, two two kiddos. So I mean, that's overhead right there. Plus, you're paying your utilities and all that. Overhead kills. Well, when we moved to a bigger space, you know, we didn't double our rent, but pretty close to that. Yeah, I mean, overhead kills, but your margins. Overhead's all right if your margins are okay. And so I've been part of the churches that were staff heavy and had many people on staff and the church is barely able to pay their bills. That's not good. You don't, that's not, that's not good business. That's not good stewardship if you want to be the Christian word. Is there a Christian dictionary in the house? No. We should right. create one, a Christian dictionary app. <laughs> Patent pending. The one, the one thing that's different about business though than, than church overhead is, and maybe it's not that different, but with, with churches, you know, you're basically telling people they have to tithe because God says to do it. So you kind of can budget that, you know, you, you expect, I mean, and I know that it's not like that. I know that there's people that tithe randomly and there's some people that, you know, and I've been a part of where churches are like, oh crap, these people weren't here this week. We didn't, we didn't get their tithe, you know, and we're not going to be able to pay our bill. And so, but with, with business, you know, every month is a new month. What if no sales come in today, you know, and it's, it's a little different, uh, when it comes to, to the budgeting aspect of between a church and a business. I think there's a lot of similarities. Well, and any more churches are, really operating like other non-profits and they have those keystone givers uh, the guys who have made a pledge to every month even if they're not there they're still going to give the same amount right and that's well now thing. online giving in in auto pay giving which then i just asked the question you know and who knows what the right answer is but if it's just automatically coming out of my account and i'm not like I'm not seeing it. Does, is that really what the tithe was meant for either? You know, like, is it the number obligation? Is that what it was? Or, you know, it, there's there. What I'm trying to say is there's something about, like, putting it out there, you know. Right. Kind of like having it, it taken out and that was my check before you even know about it. Ex exactly. And, I mean, especially, like, how bad I am at doing a budget. If it just comes out, like, I don't see it. I don't even know that I tithe. I look back and I'm like, oh, okay, I did tithe. All right, I'm good. All this money's mine. <laughs> but, but that's what I was trying to get. Also, one of the questions I was just kind of throwing out there with house churches is, what if? Okay, so so now we we tithe to the central fund. Would it would it feel any different if we took our tithe that we physically gave and know that it's ours and it's a smaller amount, but even bigger than most churches yearly? 
I think mon- monthly would be bigger than most churches' yearly uh, missions <laughs> budget fund because of all the overhead. But so what if we took that, our own tithes that we've given to God, that we are able to take that ourselves and give it to others? I think that would be super impactful than it is to like we give money to the church and then the church does this, you know, in the church. You know, we hear stories about all the good things that our church does. We've built playgrounds for for places and we've given a lot, you know, to our community. I think we're one of the most giving to the community. But in the sense, though, it's different if you're giving it, giving your own money or giving the money that you've earned and you're giving to God and then you take it out yourself. I don't know. I think that would be super impactful in a, in your walk with Christ. So since believers are in a church building, kind of want to wrap this up and tie it all together. You know, you're, we, you're done talking about overhead. Yeah, um, because uh, just wait until the clergy salary. Okay, that might be a two hour podcast. That'll be a, a special episode. It'll be a two point or two parter. It'll be a two com- be to be continued. Yeah, Dusty's just gonna give up, get up and leave during it, <laughs> just, and I'm just gonna continue on my rant. He'll come back. Actually. Andrew, I have a job. I have to go work. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but we kind of want to wrap it up together because we've talked about the overhead, we've talked about the building, we've talked about other things. So, since believers are only in the church building for one or two, three hours a week. Does it really serve its purpose? I mean, with all this overhead, does having the building really serve its purpose? Well, you know, and I think some churches try to help that by offering it to the community, you know, like a, like a boy scouts are able to meet on Monday nights or whatever, or this ladies group can meet here, you know, whatever's going on. Um, team, team banquets sometimes can use churches for free weddings, you know, but I don't know. Does that make a big impact on people or is that just, I mean, it gets you in their building. It gets you in the church. But then (laughs) does that not increase the overhead when you're, you're allowing these groups to come in for free? It does, but it's, it's called evangelism, right? (laughs) It's part of the evangelism budget because you're getting all these people in your church that don't normally go to church and they're supposed to see all your cool lights and your cool setup and get up and like, yeah, hey, but, this isn't as country as I thought it was. But does that happen if they, say, meet in a conference room or if they just meet in the lobby? They don't see all that cool stuff. Or you can pay – a church can pay sponsor for them to be in some place awesome. <laughs> I don't know. I, I 100% fully agree with having a church building because that does give – those who are not connected, a place to get connected. But at the same time, all this overhead it just kills really you. Kills I mean, because it just costs a lot. You know, it does. moving a business from your house to a spot on the strip is expensive, and that's when you're like, "Oh crap! I got to do a lot more to make sure I keep my money coming in." You know, and uh, it's a lot more work. You know, so then you have to add staff people because you're having to make it more. It's just not as organic. You know, when you have a house church, like when we we were part of the church plant going through different, different scenarios of how we would meet. One of the things that we um, talked about was, you know, meeting at a school or somewhere once a month as a big corporate group, you know, because there is value in corporate worship, too. You know, there is. Um, I think it said in this book, it talks about like people quote the book, the verse, do not forsake assembling together as some are in the habit of doing. And they quote that as in do not skip church. That's really not what that meant because you can't skip what we are. <laughs> I think that was the point there. We are the church, you know, everything that we're doing, like do not forsake, you know, getting together with your brothers and sisters and doing life together. I think was what they were trying to say. The verse more represented than skipping your Sunday service. But I mean, there's, like I said, there's good things to a building, but there's also a lot of things that you have to compromise. Cause if you don't have a building, you can talk, you can say exactly what the Bible says about things. If you do have a building, you can say it. Just I hope you don't make people mad. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So that's going to wrap it up for this week. Next week, we're going over the order of worship. Sunday mornings, are they set in concrete? 
Pretty much, I would say. Three songs. Announcements. Announcements. Tithing. Sermon. Announcements. Announcements again, <laughs> just in case you forgot. Give God a hand and you're out of here. And then maybe once a year we'll do a baptism because we finally reach somebody. For That's right. I don't know. Chapter three, it doesn't really sound like the order of worship would take a long time. But chapter three is quite long. Yeah. We need to get the audible version of this. Well, we'll catch you guys next week. Have a good one. Take care. Two bros in the Bible Belt.